now it is my joy to introduce uh, our uh, plenary speaker today. And I want to introduce you to the Reverend Dr. Matthew P. John. He considers himself a citizen of the world. He's originally an electrical engineer from the East, India. He pursued a successful corporate career in the Middle East, Kuwait, and eventually transitioned from technology to theology in the West, Canada, where I know he was a successful church planter as well. That blesses our hearts in this group. Uh, he holds a master's degree in theological studies from the University of Toronto, Canada, and a PhD in intercultural studies from, of all places, Fuller Theological Seminary, with a specialization in film and theology. His dissertation won the prestigious Alan Tippett Award, we know Alan Tippett here, for bringing three disciplines together, that is, cultural anthropology, world religions, and world cinema, into a trialogue. Matthew John is the creator of The Mosaic Course, an online platform for exploring world religions from a Christian perspective. He is also an award-winning producer and alumnus of the Professional Producers Program at UCLA School of Theater, Film, and Television. And lastly, he has newly been appointed and is currently serving as the senior pastor of the historic Lake Avenue Church in Pasadena, California. I'm a member there, and it's my honor to introduce my former student, who is now my senior pastor, the Reverend Dr. Matthew John. Well, it's uh, quite a humbling and uh, an intimidating task to be a plenary speaker while my professors and peers <laughs> and uh, most of my dissertation committee supervisors are all sitting here. <laughs> so I honestly forgot everything I wanted to say. All I can think of is... <laughs> All I can think of is I need to get at least a B plus to get, get out of this, right? Yeah. Yes, like uh, Dr. King said, my claim to fame is Dr. Roberta King, um, uh, who is the ASM president, and uh, Dr. Daniel Shaw, who might be somewhere here. Sam Sam oh, yeah, there is. Yeah, Samo Dan. <laughs> and uh, uh, they taught me how to uh, research and how to do what I've been doing. So they were my boss, uh, bosses for a while, but now they both they both attend uh, Lake Avenue Church, which is where Fuller Seminary started. Now I am their boss, so that's uh, <laughs> tables have turned. This is uh, this is what we call uh, in Hollywood Hollywood twist. You know that that's what happens. So. Um, coming from Los Angeles and talking about movies. Uh, I know as missiologists, all of you are interested in the life of the other, right? Um, that is fundamentally, I believe, missiology is um, how God speaks to uh, the other and how do we decipher through their lens and how do we create cultural bridges or missiological bridges and that is the ultimate task of a missiologist. Uh, how and, and, and Probably, and this doesn't need any uh, ass assertion or proof, that the best way to understand another person is to hear his or her story or their story, right? Like the other person's story, because the stories uh, open up the deep, um, you know, it, it takes us to the core of someone's soul, right? We make that connection. And that wa that's why storytelling has always been part of uh, humanity, you know, starting from uh, oral culture to now today in the visual culture. And, and you know, a film has undoubtedly uh, is the most popular form of storytelling. Uh, and my research in particular was how to use movies as a datum of culture, data of culture 
or how to observe and interpret culture uh, through, through cinema, uh, right? Um, so I will talk a little bit about my research that way, but how do we use this uh, unexpected uh, gift that God has given to us as world cinema? Uh, back in the days when I, I grew up in India, um, you know, uh, for me to watch a foreign movies back in the days, there would be one one theater in one city. Uh, in you know, you wait for three months for a movie to whatever, you want to watch a Japanese movie or Chinese movie or whatever movie. Hollywood was always there, but you know, <laughs> real foreign film. But um, uh, but now. Uh, you know, all I need to do is just to do a search. It's all in my world cinema. Is at my fingertip uh, to stream. Um, so it is a great tool for missiological inquiry uh, and uh, ethnographic uh, investigation uh, in, in, in so many different ways. So just to uh, give, uh, so I haven't flexed my academic muscles in a long time. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a pastor, um, at least now, or a practicing a missiologist, as you would say. Um, so uh, just to, as, a, as an icebreaker or a brain teaser, uh, I will show you a dialogue from a movie, and some of you saw my PowerPoint, so I don't want you to answer this, but <laughs> so I'm going to show you a dialogue from a Hollywood movie that's more familiar to us. And uh, I want to, so this is actually a dialogue uh, where a father basically leaves his son to the world, you know, and, you know to grow up <laughs> uh, to another world, and, and this is that parting, uh, speech of the father to his son who is going away from home. And I want you to, uh, to, to tell me who is the father and who is the son. So live as one of them, son, to discover where your strength and your power are needed. Always hold in your heart the pride of your special heritage. They can be a great people they wish to be. They only lack the light to show the way. For this reason, above all, their capacity for good, I have sent them you, my only son. Now, if I didn't, you know, if people who didn't know Superman are actually, you know, Superman is not his real name, right? How many of you can say his real name? Superman is not his name. What is his? Cal L, right? Yeah, yeah. Where the word L comes from, you, you know, El Shaddai, Elohim, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? And obviously, the the, the creators of Superman are by no means Christians. Uh, they are secular Jews. One of them from Canada, by the way. <laughs> um, uh, so they had no particular intention to create a missiological vessel to communicate anything. Uh, but Superman is someone we would call in the field of theological criticism of movies uh, a, a Christ figure, right? Like, you know, because Superman has this uh, dual persona. On one side, he is a suffering servant, uh, as Clark Kent, a fumbling, uh, you know, ordinary average guy. Uh, but then he suddenly transitioned into, into the triumphant king. Uh, the messianic figure uh, of, uh, you know. So these are not intentionally placed in the movie to, like a Christian movie, they are not trying to pontificate, it's not a propaganda, but it is, and as you all know this, these are mythical archetypes that is embedded in the work of imagination, right? Uh, so um, the point, and again, as missiologists, we know this from the old, uh, Peace Child, right? Uh, he, um, Don Richardson called this a redemptive analogy. By the way, uh, Steve Richardson, who was the Peace Child, I hope all of you know Peace Child, right? I don't think I need to explain this. Uh, but the Peace Child, Steve Richardson, was speaking in our church a month ago. He was actually, he is a sent missionary from our church, uh, which is something which, are, which we are proud of our <laughs> church heritage. Um, but the idea of redemption, redemptive analogy is the 
is the fundamental presupposition that God has implanted some communication keys uh, as eye openers, that's what Don Richardson used some of these words, to, to at least for us to start communicating the gospel. And one of my life's work uh, was using that idea of redemptive analogy and the unknown God in Acts chapter 17, you know what I'm talking about, and using that as a, as a lens to look at uh, five major world religions, which is, uh, as you know, uh, Judaism, Islam, and then going to Hinduism, Buddhism, and Sikhism. That's what you heard about the Mosaic course. Uh, that's not what I'm going to talk about. But it's interesting that when you look at the, because religion essentially, as Melanie Wright, a religious scholar put it, religion is a narrative producing mechanism. Religion is fundamentally a story, right? And I, I preached this in my church one day, and then, you know, because I said, uh, you go to a church or a temple or a mosque in any other part of the world, uh, nobody looks at the statement of faith. Right? We, don't, we don't look at the statement of faith. That's not how it works. But we spend in our church countless hours on looking at the statement of faith and perfecting it, the proposition, is it the right one, and all that. But, as, but what connects us is the sacred story. We are, we, are, we are part of the story of for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. Right? Like, you know, that's the story that connects us all. I suppose statement of faith is important, but the point is, again, uh, each religion in its narrative, embedded in that narrative, is what Don Richardson called a redemptive analogy, but secular film critics would call a Christian Christ figure, Christ figure. Uh, so that's not a Christian, that's not coming from the theological film, it's from a secular uh, field. They have coined that term because most of the good stories including literature and movies are embedded in a, in, in a figure called Christ figure. And uh, uh, I don't know how many of you have seen this movie, Cool Hand Luke. And there is no intention of placing Paul, you know, Paul Newman as a Christ figure, but that he emerged as a Christ figure in this movie, if you watch it. Even the placement of him, that's actually like in a bar. <laughs> He's, uh, so this is no crucifixion. but. Uh, a Christ figure is a character in a story that follows the main thread of the Christ story while disguising it through a surface narr narrative. So they are not talking about Jesus, but it, is, uh, it can be through an allegory because there would be a character. Uh, it can be a man or a woman, and it can be even an animal in some movies. So it's not like a, like a, like a you know, Jesus, right, in that way. Christ figure, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, but that character might go through a death and resurrection in a metaphorical sense, uh, you know. So that, that emerges as a Christ figure uh, in, in that archetypical narrative of the story. Or it can be through illusion. Uh, it could be a character who is a self-sacrificing hero. Uh, in most of the movies, it is that self, a, a, uh, redemption almost always comes in a good story through a self-sacrifice of somebody, uh, which kind of, you know, that, that's, that's a fundamental narrative of the cosmos, right? Like, you know, the sacrifice brings forth life. Uh, and so the, that has to be in a good story, Christian or not, doesn't really matter. That, that's a part of a good story. And sometime, as I said, or as we saw in the case of Superman, it could be uh, a mythical archetype where Christ's story is projected outside its historical uh, context to, to a context without time and space, you know, like Superman. Uh, you know, it doesn't specifically a time or space, it's just a cosmic kind of a superhero uh, kind of a character. Uh, so uh, so that, that, that is the idea of Christ figure. And uh, some of the, I don't know how many of you watched the movie, Jennifer and I was just talking about that being one of her favorite movie, and this is also one of my favorite movies. And this is a Danish film, I think in the late 1980s, won the best Oscar for foreign language film. Uh, actually, it was, uh, it's based on a book, I'm pretty sure. It was written to make fun of Christians. 
Uh, it is a provocative film. It's actually a satire. It's very provocative film against Christianity, or at least the practice of it. But it turns out to be essentially, I don't want to give out the story, but uh, it is uh, the story of two uh, women who are practicing a very legalistic Christianity were the daughters of a priest, and then suddenly a French chef walks into their life, she becomes their maid, and then, you know, anyway, she wins a lottery kind of stuff, and then she, she cooks this delicious meal, extravagant meal, uh, for, this, for their ch little church, which is very legalistic, and the, she makes this French, anyway. So uh, it's, it's very interesting uh, the way that story unfolds through uh, Babbitt's self-sacrifice. There's a clim climactic twist, which I cannot reveal to you because I would really like you to watch the movie. But in this, uh, <laughs> but in this movie, which was actually written to make fun of Christia Christians and Christianity, uh, would bring tears to your eyes to see how Babette, who is a woman, uh, emerges as a Christ figure. Uh, and uh, I would say anywhere uh, in any platform, film and theology is taught, Babette's feast is, is almost always shown. Uh, so that's very interesting. And uh, another movie, I don't know how many of you have seen this movie called Green Mile, Tom Hanks movie, early 2000. Uh, there is this character called uh, John Coffey, that's his name, and he is accused of uh, for something that he has, he has never, uh, he is accused of a crime he has never committed, uh, but he has some kind of a supernatural healing power. Uh, he heals the sick and he even uh, gives life to a little mouse uh, in that story. Um, and interestingly, J John Coffey uh, and J.C., you know, they, they say it was planted because J.C., Jesus Christ, because he is a, he's a very, cl uh, you know, classic picture of, G you know. So anyway, the idea of, of Christ figure that emerged from uh, the field of uh, film criticism, uh, if we interlace that with cultural anthropology, uh, or, or studying culture, studying the other, right? And then the missiologists have a great vehicle uh, to enter into the world of the other in an uh, in a, in entertaining and engaging fashion. You know, without even going to the mission field, uh, you know, maybe going to the Netflix and to understand and appreciate other culture and wonder if God is already speaking to them in one way or the other. That's the whole idea. Uh, like I said before, this is just a screenshot of Netflix, you know, the foreign film, just the, the plethora, you know, the availability of all of this. So uh, when I did my dissertation based on it, um, I was very fortunate, uh, like Dan Shaw was my mentor, uh, and uh, Dr. King was my, uh, my uh, in the committee, uh, and, uh, and it, in somehow it happened to be a very interesting field so we got got invitation from uh, AAA, uh, not the other AAA, the American Anthropological Association, <laughs> which uh, which uh, which not always welcomes seminary students to present, um, and uh, UCLA and you know these are secular bodies very interested in 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 using uh, uh, these movies as a as a, to develop a methodology. Uh, to create and um, and even you know my dissertation got published by uh, Fortress Press. I didn't I didn't I didn't have any copy there, but I have one. I mean, they even paid for this, right? You know, nobody pays for a, a student's dissertation anyway. Which is so so they, it's a fascinating new field, and I'm say, saying this to encourage you to to enter venture into that field because there is so much work to be done uh, in that area uh, of world cinema. Um, so this is my other mentor, the only person who is missing in, the, in this room. Uh, he has written a book called Real Spirituality, Rob Johnston. He is a pioneer scholar in the field of theological criticism of movies at Fuller. It says, movies function as a primary source of power and meaning for people throughout the world. Along with the church, the synagogue, the mosque, and the temple, they often provide people stories through which they can understand their lives. And I know that I don't have to sell this to this crowd, uh, because that is where, and you know, I was born and raised in India, and this is literally true. 
in, in India. We look at our stars and stars, uh, our stars as gods and goddesses, uh, and, and, and there are literal temples being built to the stars. Uh, they are considered the personification, not in, even in a metaphorical sense, in a literal sense. Uh, right, because the, the film itself become a religious experience. That's the power of film. The power of film is that it gives you an experience of transcendence, right? It take you, transport you to another reality, and which is what religion does, right? So, so that is the, uh, it, yeah, it's a fascinating field. Um, so this was my, uh, I, I can talk a lot about it, but I want to be mindful of my time. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to take ask uh, take questions, so that might be better. But so what, one of my research, and I used this movie as a case study. The movie is called Water. It was nominated for best foreign best foreign language film, uh, but it didn't win. Uh, it's developed. It's uh, it's made by an Indo-Canadian uh, filmmaker uh, named Deba Mehta. Uh, she is very very. Uh, uh, famous, uh, I would say rather notorious uh, in India because she's Indo-Canadian, so she left India but from Canada. I, I'm an Indo-Canadian too. I live in the US but I'm a Canadian citizen, uh, Indian citizen too. Anyway, um, it's long, I don't know who I am anymore, but yeah, so. Uh, so uh, but uh, Deepa Mehta created these three movies. Uh, it's, they are called, together they are called the, the Elements tr Trilogy. Um, uh, the first one was called Fire, which she called it uh, the politics of sexuality. It is about the same sex uh, relationship between two housewives in India. Now that in so many ways breaking so many taboos and the people bur literally burned the theater and all that kind of stuff. And then uh, second she made another movie called Earth. Earth she called the politics of nationality. It is about India's uh, splitting the the British uh, splitting India, in the, the, con the, the continent into India and Pakistan, and what emerged out of that. And the third one, uh, water, uh, she called it's the politics of religion. Uh, so this is, anyway, uh, this is about um, the child widows in India. Uh, so the central character of the story is an eight-year-old girl who is already married and she becomes a widow. Uh, uh, because her old husband dies of natural causes. Uh, uh, to be fair, the story unfolds in the 1930s. It doesn't necessarily happen today. Uh, but it is a social critic because she doesn't exist in the eyes of religion. Uh, because when a widow, when, when a husband dies, the woman has no existence. She doesn't exist. Uh, so anyway, uh, so a lot of story uh, uh, unfold. Uh, so I use this as a... What I, would, what I did was developing a methodology to enter into the diegetic world of the movie. See, the movie has two different worlds, right? Like in, in the sense that the movie invites you into a 1930s India, you know, that's where you go, but the movie was actually shot in Sri Lanka, which was not even India, that's another country, uh, in, the, in the late 2000, that's the power of movies. Uh, there, is a, there is an actual world of movie, then there is a diegetic world of the movie, right? But how do we enter into the diegetic world of the movie and, and do a field research, right? Uh, and uh, if you are a good anthropologist and you know that the, 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 the primary way of doing field research is something called participant observation, where you look at, uh, uh, you enter into the world of your subject and to try to understand it from their context and their point of view, and the uh, participant observation is done in a, in a continuum, you know, as we say. Uh, on one side, there's an active participant observation where you are there. Like my Professor Dan Shaw is, we call him Samo Dan because he is, uh, <laughs> he is initiated into their community and, and that's who he is. Uh, um, but there is also non-participant observation where the observer is completely has supposedly an objective perspective and who's not a participant. So I introduced a methodology, uh, what I called, which is new, uh, it's called virtual participant observation. How do you enter into this field virtually, right? Uh, and uh, because that's what movies does. The movies invite you uh, to, to a world. Uh, it, it creates and then you really enter into that. Uh, and anyway, that, 
I'm happy to answer some questions, but you know, so that, that was basically my contribution. Uh, but then again, uh, okay, I, I might come to that. I probably have a couple more slides and then I'll stop. I don't know, how am I doing with my time? Um, oh, I have 10 minutes, okay. <laughs> um, yes, okay, oh. Uh, this was, uh, I just wanted to show you that I'm still a little academic. Don't look at, look down on me as a pastor, you know, so I, I can, I also have some. <laughs> so this is uh, the foundational theoretical perspective of my research, which is uh, what we call an uh, uh, anthropology of performance by Victor Turner. And there were a couple other stuff too. We used a postmodern, you know, theories in anthropology where we look at culture as text. Uh, by Clifford Gates, you know, this is from the 70s. Culture is, you know, as he probably is one of the pioneer scholars who said, scientific methodologies, whatever we develop, is every, every perspective, there's no objective perspectives anymore, every, everything. So ultimately what you, what you give us ethnography is a thick description, according to him, right? Like the, which means that you, you try to explain it as a story. Basically, that, that's the postmodernism is all about stories, right? Uh, the thick description. So culture, which is what a movie is. A movie is fundamentally is a story. So, oh, okay. Okay, now I did everything. So, <laughs> so uh, coming back to, yeah. So culture as text, and then we have uh, culture as image. There is this whole field of visual anthropology which is what I would strongly encourage you to get into some research. Visual anthropology is a fascinating topic. Uh, and that's why I got some of these invitations from the secular bodies. It's an emerging field. Uh, so so that, that projects culture as image, right? Culture as text, culture as image. And this is culture as performance. Performance becomes part of music. This is all part of performative element. Anyway, uh, I don't, I don't, uh, this is important, not important. It essentially shows uh, the, the drama that we, we see in a stage or a, uh, or a screen. My addition was screen, uh, uh, you know, but a stage drama is how it is connected to the cultural drama or social drama that unfold in our society, right? Everything we, we, we do, the conference, ASM conference is a drama. It's a social drama. Uh, you know, it has a narrative structure to it. Uh, a, a, a war is a, is a drama. A, 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 a scandal is a drama. It's, these are called social dramas. And how it is reflected in the stage drama, and it becomes a mutually contributive, uh, like a dynamic interchange between both the social drama and the screen drama. How it feeds into each other. It's a very interesting uh, study, uh, actually, uh, there, the, 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 the anthropology of performance. So that was my foundational theoretical perspective, and I will end with the last slide, uh, which comes to the, uh, essentially what we do is, uh, you know, the virtual par participant observation, as I said, we, we enter into the diegetic world of the movies and, and do a field research. And my actual research was I did that with the water, the, the elements tril trilogy. I observed the culture and we basically mapped it. Then I actually did the field research. I went to India, some of this part where the movies are mentioned, I interviewed the widows uh, and all those places are still there. And then I compared the, uh, the field, the actual field research and then to the, the virtual field research and then observe what are, what are the missing pieces. Obviously, uh, starts with the, uh, the main thing is the reflectivity, uh, or the, sorry, the reflexivity of the auteur, right, which is the, which is the fancy word in the movie for the author, uh, the author uh, of the movie, which is Deepa Mehta, because she is a lapsed Hindu. Uh, she has an ax to grind with Hinduism, and she is, uh, you know, and she left India, uh, and she, she is telling the story from a Canadian perspective, uh, and Canada has a Western lens uh, in looking at the Eastern uh, per, uh, act, so, so there is a, 
there, is a, there are so many elements like the reflexivity of the auteur or the context in which the movie is told. For example, if you watch an Indian movie, Bollywood movie, by the way, you probably heard about Bollywood, which is the Indian film industry. It's almost three times the size of Hollywood. It's big. It's the biggest in the world, actually. Uh, but you watch Bollywood movies, you will see, uh, you know, boy meets the girl, then they start singing and dancing. And, uh, but that's not... That's not how people do in India. It's not like we sing and dance all the time, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so because that's, for, for that, we, we do something called context criticism, which is basically the filmmaking context, which is the, how the, the driving concerns of the uh, filmmaking industry, the, the way it, you know, you now a big thing is K-drama, the Korean drama, which is taking over the world in so many different ways. But it has its own conventions in a way that it can be melodramatic, the way they present and all that kind of stuff. So, so these methodologies are already available in the field of film criticism, right? So what I did was a very simple, easy trick of marrying all this otherwise uh, um, unconnected fields together, like uh, like Dr. King said, a, a, a trialogue between the cultural anthropology, or in my case, visual anthropology and film criticism, and of course, theology is the foundation. Uh, you know, from this emerged who who uh, how how is God trying to reach? the people in other cultures, because we are all created in the image and likeness of God, right? And so God can show up in our imagination un uninvited, whether the filmmaker is a Christian or not. Right, the Cool Hand Luke, or you know, the, these movies—they they are not made by Christians. The same way, uh, the Indian movies or the Korean movies, or they are not made by Christians, but but they happen to be created in the image and likeness of God, even though they are all watching through a glass darkly. Uh, it may not be clear, uh, but but something is filtering through them. Uh, so that was the idea. Actually, I lied. I have one more slide, two more slides. So this one. So this is from. Uh, uh, this is from the movie Water. I just wanted to show it to you. Uh, only if you are from India, you will understand the significance of it. See, th these are the two major characters of the movie. That the little kid is the widow, and, and she is holding a flute. And as you can see, and then the, and the other character is the hero of the movie who basically brings redemption to the story. And he's holding the flute. And if you are from India, you know the moment you see flute, you automatically identify that character with the Lord Krishna, who is the god of, yeah, the, the, the gods of Hinduism, they all look the same. There are around 300, people, 300 million gods, uh, and they all look blue color, and they all look the same. Uh, but they are most, mostly they are identified by what they are holding. You know? uh, so if you are Rama, another major god, he always have a bow and arrow. Right? And Krishna always have a flute. Right? So, so this is the savior figure in that culture. You know, basically, she is praying to this. Uh, Krishna is the embodied God or the incarnation of, of God in Hinduism. One of the many, but the major incarnation. Uh, it's funny, when I did the research on the world religion, uh, Christ Hinduism is the only other religion, only other major religion which believes in, in incarnation. Uh, you know, we always say that Judaism and Islam are our cousins, but if you say to a Jew uh, or a Muslim that God came in human flesh, that's the ultimate blasphemy. But whereas uh, you say that to a Hindu, of course, of course God comes down as a human being, because there is that unbelievable understanding of incarnation, the embodied God, the God coming in human flesh. So that is what is depicted in that movie. If you watch it, you can see the, the, the savior figure, I don't want to call it the Christ figure, the savior figure embodied coming to the rescue of that little girl and that brings redemption to the whole story arc. So last uh, slide, A.W. Tosser, who was no, by no means a missiologist or even a theologian, but I guess a pastor like me, uh, uh, said this, uh, the value of the cleansed imagination in the sphere of religion lies in its power to perceive in natural things, shadows of things spiritual. It enables the reverend man to see the world in a grain of sand in eternity in an hour. That's the power of storytelling. That's the power of metaphor and showing something here and now to point to something then and there. And that is 
uh, the unbe unbelievable uh, transcending, uh, you know, that, that power of movies. And as missiologists, I, I hope and pray that we will be able to explore it, uh, that even more in our research. So that's my time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.